bit just to um, kind of give you a precursor. Uh, my name is Amanda Andert and uh, myself and Greg Witt will be um, providing the webinar this evening. Um, first and foremost, we do want to stress that uh, we are not experts on this. However, we have attended um, many various webinars, talking with additional resources and peers and um, gathered a lot of information. So this is to um, make some um, additional um, additional recommendations and guidelines. Um, we have muted everybody on the line. Um, so we're hoping to utilize the chat function. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box. Um, and we will be happy to address those either during the presentation, they may be answered or um, following, um, just depending on what it is. Um, again, just so you know, you know, we're doing the best we can with all the resources that we have. As we all know, COVID has been changing pretty rapidly. And um, this is kind of our presentation to best understand and um, be able to share what we've learned and some guidelines and recommendations for everybody. Um, again, my name is Amanda Andert. I'm the operations manager for ZPT Housing. And um, alongside me and probably in the, the main host of this is our previous past president of ZBT National Housing, Greg Witt. And I am going to let Greg share a little bit of his background and then I will begin sharing my screen. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, like, like, like she said, um, I'm the immediate past president of ZBT National Housing Board and um, have a lot of experience in managing chapter houses. I'm the uh, president of the, the uh, Illinois Chapter House Corporation in Champaign and been spending a lot of time uh, very focused on, on what's going on related to, to events uh, with our house at Illinois. Um, we have a, uh, we sleep, uh, we have the capacity to sleep 88 people. We have an apartment style property and uh, clearly a lot of, uh, a lot of interest going on there. Um, just a couple things before we get into the presentation, though. Um, I think everyone needs to understand that, and I think Amanda said that we're not experts. All, all we can say is that we're a little bit more informed than many, probably many people are because we've been attending a number of webinars that have been put on by various Greek housing management organizations, universities, and um, and reading material that's been, been pushed out by all these various resources, including our insurance broker and others. Um, I think the most important thing that we all need to understand, there's no pl playbook on COVID. Um, we're all kind of winging this. We're doing the best uh, and trying to create um, what we think are best practices uh, for in this in this presentation. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk talk about issues. Um, we're encouraging you, if you do have questions, to, to shoot through the chat box. Uh, we think there'll be time at the end of the presentation. I think if, uh, depending on how, how many questions we have, um, our actual presentations probably should be no more than 25 or 30 minutes. And um, we can open up uh, the microphones at that time. We also have uh, some people from for, uh, Libby Anderson from fraternity staff is I know, on the call. And um, I know that from some of the uh, preview questions that we got when people registered. I know there's some questions about uh, recruitment and, and social and, and maybe we can get some perspective from fraternity on, on those issues. But our, our purpose here is mostly to talk about, about housing issues and what, what that looks like returning to campus. So Amanda, if you want to start with the deck, that'd be great. Making sure everybody can see it. Greg, can you see those Not yet. slides? All right, there we go. I'm gonna minimize this thing here. Um, so yep. the presentation is gonna take, it's gonna have three parts to it. It's, it's really about how do we get the house successfully open? Developing the plan, preparing the house, and then being, being able to adapt to the curves that the uh, we're going to see as as uh, as kids get back on school and whether there's success in eliminating COVID or not sometime during the school year. Um, you know, the first part, the following plan to open the house. These are these are the issues that we're going to kind of talk about, talk through, 
I'm sure many of you will have questions as we, as we talk about each of these, these components. So let, let's talk about the physical space first. Um, there's a lot of conversations, and I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer here in terms of uh, uh, bedrooms. Uh, how, what are the sleeping arrangements going to be? Um, again, I'm, I'm going to state a lot of the things I am talking about are my own experiences with Illinois, what we're learning, what we're hearing. Um, singles and doubles are, are, are one, of the, one of the big questions that many um, university uh, officials are, are discussing what they're going to do with their own residence halls. Um, we've heard that many are, are limiting to singles. We've heard some schools are going doubles and we've even heard some cases where, where they're allowing more than two people to be in a room. But I think one of the things that uh, we're hearing from various sources and there was an article and I, I was hoping to find it for, for included in the presentation but I couldn't find it. But kind of a, the model is if you're going to have more than one person in a room it's kind of a head to toe model meaning that if you have bunk beds, uh, you know, they, one on, on lower bunk, the guy's head's to the left, and on the top, top bunk, his head's, the other guy's head's to the right. Um, the same thing if you have twin beds in, in a room. So those are the kinds of things we're hearing. We're hearing about um, possibly putting some plexiglass up be between, between beds. Um, again, we don't, know what, we don't know if there's the right answer, but I think what you need to find out is what the local universities is, is encouraging or if there's some uh, information that the state governments or local health departments are providing uh, in that regard. But those are things that you need to be giving some thought to. The next thing is, is sanitation and cleaning. Um, this is where probably a lot of uh, expectation, particularly from parents, are, are going to be. Um, limitation of procedures. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of what right and wrong ways to do it. And, and I'm not going to tell you what, what the right or wrong way is for you, but um, there's going to be a higher expectation, both from the, from the students that, that are residents in your, in your chapter houses, as well as the parents and even the universities on, on making sure that the property is clean uh, and, and regularly clean. Um, you need to set, uh, you need to talk to your cleaning crews, your, your property manager and set expectations on, on what, you're, you're going to do. I'll, again, I'll speak from our Illinois experience. Uh, in, in, in previous years, we did a weekly cleaning of the house. We had a, a service come in that cleaned all the common areas of the property. Uh, we're right now working with our property manager. I haven't gotten a cost yet, but what I'm hoping to do is have a daily cleaning, maybe an hour or two a day, particularly at high touch point areas, meaning doors, uh, entry doors, uh, dining rooms, chapter rooms, uh, common bathrooms, uh, those kinds of things, and try to keep move back. Skip ahead, Amanda. Um, and and but the one thing that we do know is that they're going to be added costs. So um, many of you need to be prepared to incur these additional costs. It's probably too late to add charges to your room board, um, but anticipate that there are going to be a lot more expense related to doing these, these, these kinds of cleaning. Bathrooms are going to be a, a real challenge for, for a lot of campuses. Um, we don't have that issue at Illinois because we're an apartment style property, meaning we have uh, four bedroom suites with a kitchenette and two bathrooms. Uh, the, the, common, the bathrooms are their own responsibility. But in a chapter house where, uh, even I remember my own days at, at Denver, uh, where we had bathrooms on, on, on both the sleeping floors, uh, those those need to there has to be some kind of limitation procedure. How many is there going to be a limitation to the number of occupants that could be in the in the bathroom at a time? What are the procedures? If you are the are the members going to self clean the bathrooms after they use a shower or use a sink? Uh, how often are the toilets going to be clean? So I think those are things that you need to figure out what you can do and what you can't do, and of course how how is it going to all occur? Um, so these are things that you need to be preparing all, all these three areas. If you haven't done this yet with, with school opening four to six weeks from now, for most of us, um, you need to be on top of this. Okay, food service is, is, is another issue and there's been a lot of uh, information uh, pushed out by various uh, 
of food service vendors uh, that, that serve the Greek community. Um, the one thing we can recommend is that you, you need to have an open dialogue with your food service provider. You have to understand what they're doing. You have to understand what um, what the best practices are. The, you know, for example, the National Restaurant Association has a self-serve program that some of these organizations are, are um, endorsing and using. Uh, there's all kind of health department codes. Where's the food being prepared? If you have your own kitchen, what are you doing there? If you're, if you're bringing a catering company in, how are you doing that? I mean, I, it's gonna be very challenging if you, you have, a, you have your own chef and they prepare the food on, on your property. It's different with the catering company if it's prepared elsewhere where there are probably better sanitation issues. But the one thing that we do know that for the most part during the COVID period, that food service is probably not going to be buffet style like most of the chapters are used to. It's probably going to be some kind of prepackaged pre food. Or I've heard um, with some of the residence halls that people going through cafeteria line will point to, there'll be people, servers behind the, behind the counter that you point to the item you want and they put it on your plate and serve it to you. Um, some of the things with social distancing requirements, uh, staggered shifts. Can you bring everybody in for a meal at the same time or are you going to have to separate people? Um, it, to some degree, um, as local communities deem housing units are, you know, is, is our roommates the housing unit or is it everybody lives in the house? So you have to figure out what the local community is going to do and how that impacts your ability to serve food. But likely in many cases, you're going to have to have staggered shifts. and you know, if you if you feed non-residents in the house, how does what does that look like? You need to come up with a plan with your with your food service provider to see if they're going to prepare meals that they can pick up, or if they're going to allow them to actually even eat in the house. Chapter interactions are going to be be really challenging. Um, as advisors and trustees to to these these undergraduates, you need to communicate the plan with your chapter leaders. What's going to happen? How how are things? What are things going to look like? Um, people are talking about controlled access to the facility, meaning what are, what are your policies in terms of letting people in into the building? Uh, not even talking about visitors yet, but talking about vendors, uh, suppliers, uh, kitchen staff, uh, Federal Express, UPS. Uh, do packages come in? Does anything get delivered to the house? Does it have to be quarantined for a while? So those are the kinds of things you have to have to give some thought to. Uh, social events, you know. Any kind of any kind of events in the house, what are they going to look like? I have no idea. Certainly, every every state's got different rules in terms of how many people can meet together as a group. Um, probably need to look at um, the uh, the possibility of holding things outside where if, if you can. Um, visitor policies are um, something that are in formation. What we are doing at Illinois is I'm. Ask, I've asked the undergraduates to develop their own COVID policies related to visitors. Um, we're still finalizing those, um, but you know we're, we're hearing all kinds of things from resident halls uh, at the Illinois campus where no no non-residents would be allowed in in the residence areas. They can, can be in the common areas on the first floor of the dining hall because they have non-residents eating there. But going upstairs, that's a no-no. Uh, so you, you got to come up with those plans. But I think um, at the end of the day, everyone's got to be optimistic. You, you need to help people maintain the right perspective on, on what's going on. It's going to be a scary time for everybody. It's going to be, um, it's going to be a new reality and, and they have to get through it. I know there was a question there. Um, uh, who's the person to enforce the chapter interaction policy? I, I think, um, you know, and, I think that's going to be the trustees and the chapter president have to uh, advisors have to come up with a plan how that's going to, how that's going to happen. Um, I don't know how else that can I you know like in, in my case I'm 165 miles away from the chapter house where I live so I'm not going down there that frequently. But other schools that are where advisors or trustees are, are local that's that may be easier to, to, to do. Yeah, Greg, and just to add on to that, just um, some of the additional re, um, regarding that question is, is we've heard a lot of, you know, the chap getting the, you know, exec boards at each one of the chapters more involved in designating people um, within the chapter to really try to adopt and take on some of these additional responsibilities and, you know, letting the brothers kind of adapt to that. Um, and then just one more thing to add regarding food service. Um, I know that both 
the fraternity website as well as our website has additional resources for food services and recommendations that have come out. Um, there's been some great resources from Upper Crust and from Campus Cooks. Um, so just, you know, I think there's a lot of additional food service resources if you guys haven't had a chance to, to look at both of the COVID sites um, for the ZBT housing as well as the fraternity, there's a lot of great resources on there. Okay, um, can't stress enough communications. Um, every webinar that we've been part of is, is, has talked first and foremost about talking to all your shareholders, your stakeholders, letting them know what is going on. Um, and again, I'll, I'll share my own experiences at Illinois. Um, and we, when, when COVID hit back in March, we sent out letters right away to not only the, the members, but the parents to let them know what was going on, uh, what our, what our plan was in terms of, uh, remote learning, how that was going to impact the house. We ended up closing, uh, the chapter house because the dorms were closed. We thought that was a prudent move. Uh, we, after the first wave of that, Got, we got paid through the first wave, then we had addressed the issues of refunds and uh, for a room and board and social dues and parlor fees and all the other fees that were, were, were associated. So we, we communicated clearly with what was going on. Now, as we're, as we're getting ready to, um, to uh, go back to school, uh, here we are probably less than a month away from when, when, when the chapter house will open, we draft a letter that's going to go out tomorrow and just give you an example of what our letter says at Illinois. And um, we're, we're trying to, we want to get buy-in uh, from parents. So uh, before I get into the letter, one of the things that we did do over the summer is we've held uh, meetings, myself and, and the other advisors with the chapter president and um, there's a parents club at Illinois. So we had a couple members of the parents club be part of our conversation. So they, they've been involved in all our planning that goes on for uh, reopening the house in, 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 the, uh, in the fall. You know, as, as we all know, there's nothing like, in particular in our case, a Jewish mother in terms of protecting her, her baby. And uh, having their, their input was very helpful to us in terms of crafting what our strategy is as we go forward. But our house, uh, our letter that's going to go out tomorrow is, is, is talk, talks a little bit about what we've done in terms of preparing the house for occupancy. Um, all the things we've, we've done in terms of cleaning and, and power washing stairwells and installation of hand sanitizer stations, soap dispensers in common bathrooms, uh, cleaning protocols changes, um, cleans of all the bedrooms. Um, then we get into, we, we, we've hired a new food service vendor. So we were giving them information about uh, of, of that vendor, uh, including our plans uh, in terms of how we're gonna do, serve uh, prepackaged meals instead of buffet style during the crisis. Then we talk about uh, move-in. And, and move-in is, is, uh, is really a challenge in, in our communication plan. Uh, we're gonna open our chapter house a week earlier than we had planned to. Campus classes start on August 24th. We typically open the house a week early. We're gonna open the house two weeks early for a couple reasons. And, and in our communication to everyone, we're gonna let the high exec members move in the first two days on, on the 10th and 11th in staggered shifts. So what we're doing with everybody is that we're gonna have three windows of uh, where someone can move into the, into the property. Um, it'll be a 10 to one, a one to four, and a four to seven. Now, most, most of our, our members live in the Chicago area, so they have anywhere from a two to three hour drive to, to get to campus. So we figure starting at 10 o'clock is, 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 is early enough. But we have, we have bedrooms on three different floors, so we're, we're not gonna let any more than two people per floor move in at any one time during a window. So we go through all the rules there and, re and request that everybody move in during that seven day period unless something happens. Now, um, what we're also asking is, uh, oh, we're, we're also gonna have some visitor policies related to move-in. Um, number one is that no more than two family members can assist in the move-in. We don't want more than three people in, in the property at any time. Everyone's gonna be required to wear face coverings while they're doing the move-in. Uh, and then before they get here, we're gonna ask three things though. One is that they take the temperature, that their own and, and, and any of their family members, and that, that has to be below 99.5 to enter the house, that if they've been exposed, they've been exposed to someone who's tested positive or for COVID, 
or late travel, travel releasing from area that the CDC believes is a COVID hotspot that they self quarantine 14 days before they return to campus. And if they're, they personally are experiencing any symptoms, they stay home until they recover from, from uh, or at least through a 14 day period. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're working on uh, we're finalizing any COVID policies so we talk about this in our letter as well. And we also um, remind people um, that they need to follow all the uh, prescribed requirements by the University of Illinois regarding social distancing, facial covering, temperature checks. And, and uh, then what's happened at Illinois, which I don't know if it's happening in many schools, Illinois has developed their own COVID test. I you know, don't know how successful or not it's going to be, but they're, they have the capacity to give 10,000 tests a day on campus. So we're gonna encourage everybody once they get on campus to take one of those tests. Um, and then the big issue that in our communication thing is, is what to do about if someone gets sick, we're not gonna have a quarantine suite at Illinois. Uh, the residence hall, the university is not going to provide it to non-residents of their own properties. So we're going to request, we can't tell people to return home, but we're, we're going to request people to uh, return home if they can, if they test positive and exposed. Uh, then we talk about, uh, we suggest uh, they be smart about use of alcohol or other substances, uh, even if they're legal age. And then we um, finally take a, a stand in terms of tell them that the trustees aren't going to be there. It's going to be up to them to um, to be responsible for themselves and their and everyone else, and remind them the three most important things they can do is practice social distancing, wash their hands, and wear face coverings. And then we thought it was a perfect time to remind them of the ZBT credo: intellectual awareness, social responsibility, integrity, and brotherly love. And you know, if they if they uh, it speaks well to the current situation if they follow those four 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 steps of the credo. Um, and then in terms of alumni, we haven't come up with alumni uh, uh, plan yet, but we plan to do some communication with them. And we have been in touch with the university. University of Illinois has been very active in terms of understanding what we are doing. Uh, we're, we're part of certified housing at the university, but the university has taken surveys of, of, our, of what we're planning to do, what we're doing in terms of our, our singles versus doubles or larger spaces, what we're doing in terms of uh, quarantine and six spaces. So um, we've been we've had at least three or four calls over the last uh, six weeks with the university and, and other uh, Greek advisors at Illinois. So those are all that's all part of our communication plan. So hopefully you guys will look at, at, at your own plan. Um, someone asked a question uh, about the Fair Housing Act. I'm not an attorney, but I I, I do um, understand from some of the webinars we've been on is that. Uh, as part of the Fair, Fair Housing Act, I do not believe, and I know there's some attorneys on the call, I do not believe that you can tell someone if they're sick that they have to leave. So that's why we, we say we encourage someone to leave and not, not telling them they have to leave. Um, and yes, Jamie Weiner asked if we can circulate the plan. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, once we finalize our letter, I'll share that. Uh, I think what we'll do is there's a COVID page that on the ZBT website, and we'll we'll get this information posted on that website. I think a lot of some of the things that Amanda were, was referring to is also on that website already. Uh, legal liability: We've done we've made changes to our room board contract, at Illinois. We were, I don't know, lucky to some extent that we delayed sending out room and board contracts until we knew that the university was going to open for in-person classes. Um, I'm a commercial real estate broker by by but it's my livelihood and I negotiate, so I negotiate leases for office tenants. And uh, when COVID was, was, going, was happening, one of my clients was negotiating an expansion lease in that property in downtown Chicago and the landlord created some language that they put in the lease amendment for, for the expansion lease that I took and put into our own lease because it modified it for a fraternity house versus a million square foot office building. But some of the things dealt with uh, how to what our rights to what we can do during a health emergency, our ability to close things and, and stop services that we offer. So our our new contract includes those provisions. Um, but I've understood, and I think there's some some stuff circulating, and I've heard from other chapter advisors at Illinois that they've created a, an addendum to their room and board contract, which deal with the COVID crisis. So. Um, consult your own chapter attorney. I don't know uh, what, I don't think we've created anything. I'm not sure that, uh, I know we used uh, uh, 
a legal service of ZBT has a uh, has a um, attorney that we use, and I don't know if they've pushed out anything. Man, did you know if? Uh, yeah. Greg, I can jump in real quick. We we okay. do have a uh, an addendum that was given to us by our um, uh, by the uh, by by our insurance company. Um, we've we've been our attorneys though have uh, cautioned us against uh, using them. Um, so again, I would I would tell everybody that uh, to check with their own uh, attorneys uh, before before they use them as their uh, you know their there's. Uh, there's there's mixed uh, information on that, Ron. I don't know if you want to add further onto that um, it, based on the information we were given this past uh, uh, past call. Uh, sure. Um, I, I don't. I, by the way, I just so you know, I I'm using them at Arizona, but um, it's been uh, point. It was pointed out by um, by Cliff Schneider that essentially the waiver is is meaningless. Um, so he suggested uh, a, a notice um, instead of a waiver um, where we're just notifying people that, you know, uh, there could be outbreaks of COVID or anything else in the house. Um, and uh, he doesn't believe that um, we would be uh, held responsible. And if people are concerned, he um, had suggested that we uh, put in, in the notice that they uh, links to uh, CDC uh, and WHO uh, uh, guidelines, um, but that, you know, essentially uh, there's really, uh, he doesn't believe the waivers are worth the paper that they're printed on. Right, in fact, if you, if in, on the, on the uh, CBT website, there is a bunch of documents from James R. Favor, who's CBT's insurance broker, and probably for many of our chapters, they're, they're insurance broker as well. There's some signage that they've, they've created and we, we intend to post, um, those kind of warnings on our door about the the risk that entering the property may they could be exposed and things like that as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's going to be a very challenging time. So the one thing I can I, I will say again, I'm not an attorney, but real estate laws and housing laws are are local, and particularly in many camp college towns, they're very tenant friendly. So you just need to make sure you you check with local council before you do anything in terms of changes to your contracts. Um, and you know, chapter policies. I think it would be it's prudent for advisors and trustees to work with the undergraduates to to create a, a COVID policy for the chapter. What you're going to do with all kinds of issues in terms of visitors, in terms of uh, of social distancing, wearing face masks, and and and, and on and on. So uh, that that that's my my suggestion to everyone. I'm going the wrong way. Right now. Okay, next next slide, please. Okay, well, you know, we've talked about all that. Now you got to prepare the house for for move-in procedures. So I, we talked about um, what you're going to do in terms of are you going to need more time to move in because you're going to have to stagger. What are you going to do about visitors and parents? Um, what about face masks? What about temperature checks before someone walks in the building? So you need to have a plan. Uh, regarding all those kinds of issues. Um, you need to talk about social distancing. What does that look like for meals? What does that look like for if you're allowed to have social events or chapter events in, in, in the property? Um, the one thing I'm going to mention only because our own property manager told us this back in, in May, installation of hand sanitizers. If you haven't ordered those yet for your property, you're, you may be too late to get them by the time school starts. There was at one point a 12 week lead time to get hand sanitizers. Um, disinfectant, big bulk disinfectant wipes to, to have in the house. All those kinds of things are, are part of the preparation that you need to do. Uh, so get on it now if you haven't, uh, but just our own experience. I'm, I'm hoping our guy has everything in place by August 10th. Okay, adapting. Um, no one knows how long this is gonna last. We don't know if we start going to school and we're gonna be uh, we start in person or a hybrid model with in person and remote or and then all of a sudden they pull the plug and said we're going 100% remote. So all these kinds of things are going to 
kind of require you to be flexible in terms of what you're going to do. What are your contingency plans? Um, one of the questions that I got asked by our undergraduates just a week ago was, okay, um, what happens if uh, we're, we're at school and come Thanksgiving, they tell us not to come back to campus? Is the house going to stay open? Um, the kids want to come back to school. So, uh, and then it becomes a financial decision as, as well as a health decision. Our intent right now at Illinois is that unless the university tells us otherwise, we're going to allow the kids to remain in the house, even if they're 100% remote. Um, you know, as, as many of you probably experienced, the financial hit of, of closing and offering refunds for half a semester was, was exorbitant for us. And we, we gave probably sixty or $70,000 in, in refunds and credits. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we we're able to cut a deal with our landlord to not pay rent. So that was, that was helpful. That was helpful for us. But uh, you, you have to come up with a plan. Uh, if, if your members get exposed, uh, are you going to have a sick suite? Are you going to have a quarantine suite? What are you going to, like we we're going to tell at Illinois, ask our, ask people to go home. Um, but you, you got to have a plan. You have to understand, you got to work with the university to, to do that. And that really gets down to um, social events and recruitments. Um, I know that the fraternity has been hosting and Libby's on the call if people have questions regarding that, but um, they've been working on plans to how, how do you do recruitment in, in a COVID environment? How do you have social events? What are you, know, what, how do you justify social dues if you don't have any social? So those are all issues that you, you've got to be prepared to address, but understand that what, what we talk about today on July 14th may be different on September 1st or October or, or Thanksgiving or Christmas or, or going into the second semester. So be flexible, uh, communicate, make sure you, you tell people what you're gonna do. You, particularly the parents have to know what's going on. Uh, talk to your university, make sure you're, you're, you're in sync with what their, their conversations are. Uh, if there are group, group conversations put on by the university, take part in them because they're, they are helpful. You're hearing what, you, what your uh, other Greek organizations are doing. You're hearing what the university's plans are and they're gonna be open and honest with you because everyone's in this together. And then just, just the reminders, uh, your expectations. This, the hard thing is, will the, will the undergraduates follow these, these, these things? And we, we were all college students once and we get it, but I think to some extent, uh, you've got to stress the importance of, of all these issues. Uh, the big three, you know, covering your face, social distancing, wash your hands. You've got to make sure they, they understand the reasons why we have, there's going to be visitor policies and, and why they need to be enforced. And then they got to they got to clean up after themselves. I mean, there's no question. Um, it's it's we know how these you know if you ever walked into a chapter house on a Sunday morning, you you, you know what it looks like. Um, and so we've got to we've got to make sure they understand these things that these are expectations, these are requirements, and uh, things are going to be a little bit different for for this semester. I think that's pretty much it. So, if there are any questions or comments, uh, Amanda, if you want, I don't know if people want to. You want to open the mics or do it on chat? It's up to you guys. So why don't we leave the? Why don't you put the mics out, open up everyone's microphone? Um, I'm, or you, I think you can unmute yourselves, or um, I can unmute. I believe I can unmute everybody. One minute. I guess we covered everything, huh? <laughs> See here. Let me just stop sharing my screen and that will probably allow me. Yeah, to now everybody can see. Does everybody know how to unmute themselves in the top right corner? You can go and you can you can click and unmute yourselves. I'm sorry, on your name. And then it will allow you to unmute yourself. Does everybody know how to do that? If you don't and you want to talk, wave your hand. Wave your hand, then I can absolutely let you in. <laughs> um, I, I would just, uh, I just have a, this is Ron. I have a, just a couple of things to add. Um, and I guess, first of all, uh, Greg, thank you very much. That was, uh, appreciate all of that. And I know that you've really been on this and attending all of the, uh, the other webinars uh, offered to us. And uh, I, I appreciate you uh, getting this together and, and doing it. And of course, Amanda, uh, you as well. So I wanna thank the both of you uh, for, for the presentation. Uh, the, only, the only other thing I just wanted to, um, uh, raise uh, with everybody that I've um, actually kind of had conversations with today with the um, service that I use to do billing is um, 
uh, in the past, I would uh, typically allow um, uh, brothers to pay, particularly those that lived in, on sort of a, a 10 month basis um, from usually July uh, until March. And, um, and I have been advised not to do that um, and to get as much money as possible up front um, just because of the nature of not un knowing what's going to happen with, uh, with, our, with these institutions. There is a, a, and I think Greg referred to it, there, there is a school of thought that uh, everybody's being um, very optimistic and um, and that you know two or three or even four weeks in, uh, when uh, half the student population is positive for COVID, they're basically going to throw up their hands and send everybody home. Um, and um, and I think that that is a distinct possibility. And of course, for those that that own after houses and have a mortgage due, uh, that could present a huge problem. And and for a renter like uh, like us at Arizona, um, it's it's also a, a big issue. So um, I, I'm not offering those monthly plans. If, um, if somebody does uh, want to reach out and contact me uh, and, and has a, a good economic reason, uh, I, I may do it, um, but, but I'm trying to stay away from that uh, and trying to collect, uh, again, as much money as possible. So um, basically I've given people discounts to pay in two payments, one payment uh, August 1st and the second payment um, December, December 1st. Uh, and then um, if they don't choose that option, uh, we're going to collect um, the, the uh, uh, half, half of the money, uh, one, one on August 1st, a second payment on September 15th, uh, a third payment um, uh, in November, and a fourth payment in December. That's, uh, that's what we've chosen to do just because uh, uh, we are concerned that uh, we're not going to, that people are sort of going to take a wait and see approach uh, and pay as little as possible uh, to make a determination uh, so that they're not, uh, so, you know, quote unquote, holding the bag if, if school ends. Great. This is Steve. Uh, thanks to you and Amanda for your uh, efforts. I, I just want to touch upon the fact that space is going to be limited on your campuses. And you're, most of us are going to need larger rooms to have meetings in, to have events in. I encourage your groups to uh, start making reservations, whether it be for rituals, for your Monday night meetings, for recruitment uh, events. You want to look around your campus, look around your community. Others, it's going to become apparent to them when they hit campus, they can't do these things in their house. And uh, you want to grab up the space that's available that's going to meet your needs and allow for social distancing. Uh, certainly we're gonna have to move in to the uh, recruitment end of things. Uh, uh, as advisors, we, we are going to need to work with our groups as to uh, what type of activities outside of the chapter house are going to be doable. Uh, we're already talking about splitting into recruitment groups, recruiters and, rec uh, and recruits and rotating them around because we're not going to have to, ha we can't have events with 75 guys or 150 guys. We're, we're looking at no more than 50 at a recruitment event, 25 recruiters, 25 recruits, and staggering the events, holding them concurrently, uh, and looking at where to do these things. So uh, I throw that out. Uh, uh, we're already having some challenges getting some space on our campus. Encourage you to look into your options. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a really good point, Steve, but I will caution everybody um, to, to please check with your institution. Uh, as an example, uh, Tulane, uh, yesterday, I think it was Libby, had said that um, uh, no more, no congregating over 10, and that if they catch their students doing so, uh, they will. Uh, uh, send them home and, and perhaps uh, uh, also uh, throw them out of school. If so, they, are, they, are they having, Ron, are they having chapter uh, classes with more than 10 people? I, I don't know, but they've made it very clear that um, they are not allowing groups to congregate more than 10. And, it it um, was, the, the article specifically was on partying. So how they define partying, I'm not quite sure, but it was a, it was a CNN article and it was about, uh, 
if, if they are caught partying in, in groups larger than that. Uh, and so I don't know if a, a recruitment, you know, event is considered a party. Uh, and again, you know, that, that to be determined, Steve, but Tulane University did put that out yesterday. So uh, yeah, that is a good question, Steve. And I'm sure there's lots of other questions you would probably follow up with on that. <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, we have to be mindful of safety restrictions, but what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If the school is going to have gatherings of 30 people, we can have meetings of 30 people. Uh, and we have First Amendment issues here too. So uh, let's keep those things in mind and free Roger Stone, yeah. <laughs> um, hi, uh, Greg, you talked a little bit about visitation policies. Can you, do you have any advice in, or Amanda as well about um, brothers who don't live in the facility and how to proceed with them? Because um, obviously the space is there as, as well. However, they're not living here. Yeah, we're working on that. We, we believe that the non-resident members have to have access to the chapter house. We don't see how you can function as a, a property. We, at Illinois, the, the, uh, the sophomores and juniors live in the house, the freshmen and seniors don't. And, and um, we will have to figure it out. We have a big property. We can, you know, it's just a question of can, but in Illinois right now, we're restricted to gatherings of less than 50 people or less. So I, again, we have to see how that, that, that'll work out. But we're, we're right now, our intent is, as part of our policy, um, you know, they'll be, they'll have subject to temperature checks, they'll be subject to exposure requirements, all those kinds of things that we'll put in the, in our, in our policy. And once we, once we do get that, I'll share that with, with the fraternity staff and I can get on the website as well as an example, but I'm hoping to have that finalized this week. Yeah, and I think just to piggyback off of Greg a little bit there too, I think there's a lot of um, policies that may be coming out with either within the university as far as number of gatherings, as well as when you're in those environments where even if it's a common area of the house, asking brothers to wear masks. I, I mean, again, who knows how realistic that's actually going to be, but that would be the recommendation is for, you know, those that are not within their like living quarters of bedrooms and and those types of facilities having to wear, um, you know, not only monitor and check and do like a temperature check, but also, you know, making sure that they're also practicing that, such as wearing face coverings. And I'm going on the, on the assumption that if one kid gets COVID, the whole house is going to get COVID and that's, there's nothing else we're really going to be able to do about it. And I think everyone's going to have that expectation. I think they're going in there with eyes wide open. Uh, I played golf on Sunday with the, uh, Illinois president's father and we were talking about it on the golf course and you know I think that's the parents expectation as well they, they know their kids they can't keep their kids home and they're going to be college kids and they'll do you know hopefully they've got they'll be smart and I'm going to guess 80 or 90 percent of the kids will be smart and there'll be 10 or 20 percent like always that are going to be screw-ups and they're not going to care. Hmm. It's a famous, uh, the famous scene in Animal House where they're in Dean Wormer's office and drunk, stoned, and stupid isn't any way to go through life. And that's, that's kind of the college fraternity experience to some extent with some of these kids. Well, Greg, having been your advisor when you were an undergraduate, this would not have changed your social life, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, right, is that what you're implying, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's a comment from Ryan um, regarding the 14 day quarantine for some from some people coming from hot spots and I can't speak for you know all the campuses. However, I was on a really long call for Kansas with um, the IFC and their Greek advisors and I know that particularly at Kansas, they are already setting up an entire dormitory for students that are coming from those hotspot states that Kansas has restricted travel on and they will be mandated to take a 14 day quarantine. Um, currently, they believe they have the occupancy and the space available for that. Um, and they think that they will be able to provide quarantine for some of the Greek life, but maybe not on the initial quarantine factors. But then after after that time frame is up. Um, I can speak for ZBT housing in that house that we are working to set up a quarantine suite in there that would be able to um, to have up to four 
people that have been infected in a quarantined area um, with their own private bathroom. So, um, you know, we're doing that where it's possible. Um, I know, like Greg said, at Illinois, that's just not possible in their house. Um, but when we have that, that is a recommendation that we're trying to make, um, you know, and obviously I think like Greg said, everybody's trying to work together. I know a lot of the Greek life offices at all the campuses are trying to make sure that we can all work together within the universities and within you know, each other trying to provide safest ways because chances are likely somebody at one of these campuses you know, is gonna be infected, so. Right, but, but to add on to what you just said, Amanda, in terms of quarantine or six suite, a um, number of the webinars that we've listened to talk about that issue, if it's going to be provided, you have to do it right. Um, you have to deliver meals to the room, you have to have private, you know, separate bathrooms for them, all kinds of things that you need to go through. So if you're going to do it, you need to make sure you're doing it right. So that, that's, that was kind of my question is that, that, you know, I've heard that, you know, yeah, you need to have a separate bathroom for every, you know, quarantine or, you know, isolated person. I mean, certainly if you have common bathrooms only, you can't do that. So is it better than if we have extra rooms? Because we've had a bunch of people just say, you know, since I've sent the, the housing contract out saying, you know, my parents won't let me live in, you know, given what's going on, which, you know, we kind of made a decision as a housing corp to say, okay, we're not going to necessarily penalize you for that because, I mean, what are we going to do, right? I mean, if someone's got an immune, uh, you know, compromised immune system where they're just not comfortable, we're just going to, you know, hold them to their to the lease it they've committed to. So, I mean, in our case, I mean, does it make more sense than do you think not to hold those rooms out and go with singles um, and split people up? Because I mean, we're going to have extra rooms and I, I was planning all along to have some sort of a quarantine space, but again, we've got the common bathroom situations. I don't know the best way to go there. I don't know if you can have with common bathrooms. How, how do you have a private bathroom for unless you can. I mean, we, we, we don't have people to get exposed. Yeah. I mean, so all of the, um, all the webinars that I think we've been on, and I think Greg, you would probably agree that um, that if you don't have the common bathrooms, you really don't have a quarantine area. So okay. um, in that particular case, um, the webinars that we've been on has suggested um, either uh, contracting with a um, local hotel, um, uh, letting kids know that uh, are suggesting or asking them to go home uh, if they're close enough to go home, um, but uh, or, or or attempting some to find some place else for them to be, because I think as Greg said, you know, if you do have a somebody that tests positive for COVID, um, and you put them into communal living situation and you continue that 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 communal living situation, it is likely that others on the property <coughs> will get COVID. So. Um, you know, if you if you don't have a, you know, a lot of houses have president suites with different bat with separate bathrooms, um, or house director suites with separate bathrooms, and you know, uh, for this semester perhaps or this year, um, those may need to be empty, uh, in in, uh, in 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 anticipation of having to use them for a COVID positive uh, uh, brother, but. Um, but again, I, I, I think that um, I would try and fill those suites that you have empty because if you don't have, I, I agree with Greg, if you don't have separate bathrooms, you're really not doing much here. Um, but, but that, but that right. even goes to what do you do? I mean, you said we can't force them to move out even if they have it, even if we were able to contract with a place that could, could do it. I mean, we can't force them to move out. No, you, um, you can't. But what you the can't health department's do, not going to force them to move out, right? I mean, uh, maybe they will. I don't know. You 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 cannot force somebody to move out. Uh, you cannot even actually force them to relocate to a different room. Right. Um, once once they establish tenancy in the room that you've given them. However, um, what you can and should do, uh, and I see that there are representatives from USC on the call, and I know that they have a, a fantastic parents organization. But what you should do is, um, as again Greg said, is communicate with the parents, um, establish a set of house rules vis-a-vis -vis COVID, put into the rules what you're going to be asking people to do, and then confirming that they're going to abide by the rules. Now, 
obviously, if they change their mind, when and if it happens, there's really nothing that you can do. But if you have those support mechanisms set up prior to the semester, I'm, I'm hopeful that you'll be far better off. But at the end of the day, um, it is correct that, uh, that you cannot make somebody uh, uh, leave their room or the property. And another quote, what's our responsibility for uh, brothers that don't live in the house? I mean, do we have any specific, I mean, I guess not legally, but I mean, from, I mean, an organizational standpoint, what should we be thinking about doing if something is someone who lives off camp, uh, not on premises, but is a member of the, the chapter, gets COVID? Um, I can just tell you at Arizona what, so, so this, this is obviously a very tough and difficult question. Um, and, you know, part of the problem for us is, is that um, we, we, we depend upon the income of the out of house brothers to pay our rent. So, um, and we're clearly not offering them a social program in the fall. Um, so we've got to offer them something. And um, we normally offer included in our dues are um, uh, lunches, which we're going to continue to do by setting up um, tables on our very large patio and being in the, obviously in the great climate of, um, of Arizona um, to be able to eat outside and we will continue offering them lunches. But one of the other things that we've done is contracted with um, a urgent care facility, a local urgent care facility to do um, testing for all of our members um, uh, upon arrival in, in Tucson before, they, before the residents move into the house um, or before um, uh, out of house members come into the, into the property. And then on a regular basis throughout the semester, up to two times uh, in, in a month. So, so that's something that we believe is an added benefit. And we're trying to look for benefits like that for our members. And of course, we also have reduced our dues because um, we're not going to have any social in the fall. Are you, are you concerned about the turnaround, turnaround time on the testing? I mean, what, what's Arizona been like? with the surge. I mean, I know Missouri, we've had much less of a surge, but like it's, I mean, people with non-symptoms, it's taken up to two weeks to get the results back. Yeah. So this is private testing. It's not state testing. And, and um, that, that's even with the private, that's at the private labs now. Yeah. The urgent care in, in the, in the kit, in this, the urgent care that we're contracting with has their own equipment. Okay. Um, and they've promised a, a turnaround time on it. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Ron, can you share what the cost of that is? Um, yeah, I actually, let me see. Um, again, this was something that, um, that was uh, offered to all Greek life um, that the university, um, the director of, of, um, of Greek life at Arizona um, came up with and we had a, a, a call. Um, and uh, it's if we sign up, it's actually really cheap. If we sign up uh, before Friday, before this Friday, it's $150 per member for the semester. I'm going to, do you guys, uh, well, I can show you the flyer on it if you want. But again, I mean, it just, it just, I would, I would suggest that you would call your Greek. So, so part of the problem is, and I, I think I heard Greg say it um, before he said, Illinois plans to run 10,000 tests. Is that what you said? Yeah, that's correct. They're, they're going to have uh, two locations on campus where they're going to be providing 10,000 tests a day. Right. They, they've, they've created their own uh, COVID test. It's this live. Right. So, so the University of Arizona has done the same thing. The problem is you're going to have 30,000 kids arrive to school, assuming that it even starts on time. Uh, at roughly the same time period. And I think, uh, I think it was George who said, you know, in terms, or, or Andy who said, you know, the, the turnaround time on this stuff. So, um, so I think that, that uh, at the very least, at the very least, for all of your tenants 
that are that are moving into the property, I would recommend that you tell them they must get a test prior to move in, um, even if they have to do it on their own, um, and and that they show you evidence of that test um, prior prior to moving in. Now, obviously, um, you're you're getting into um, some difficult weighing into some difficult areas because as I think it was Andy that said, if it takes two weeks to get a test result, right? You're, you're, it, that, that test by the time the kid shows up might be meaningless, especially if they went out and partied, you know, in the weekend between before coming to, to campus. So, I mean, I, I think I understand that, but I, but I think we wanna do the, the best that we possibly can to ensure the safety of our members, understanding fully that there's no way to do that um, uh, 100%. So, you know, I, I, but I think that, um, I think that, that I would want to, uh, to have something that, you know, because most, a lot of these kids are asymptomatic, as you all know, which presents a whole host of problems. Agree. Thanks, Ron. I will also just leave you with one last thing. As the parent of a rising junior uh, in college who uh, is going back to school, uh, I would much rather have him at school than in my house. And and I think that that is the sentiment that I've gotten from most of our parents that I've spoken to. Um, the fact of the matter is is that uh, in LA County, I looked at the statistics today. Uh, there have been zero deaths of anybody under the age of 18 um, from COVID in, in, in LA County. I haven't looked at all of it. And, and, and um, as, as we know, the, the majority of, of, of our members that get this uh, will not have, uh, um, will, will not get that, get that sick. Um, and, and, you know, I'm much more scared for example, of my son getting it and giving it to me or my wife, then then <laughs> at the fraternity house and getting it um, on his own. So I, I just think that there's, you know, in some ways, you know, obviously we don't want anybody to get this, but you know, if my kid's going to be home socializing with people here and living in my house, um, or if he's going to be home or he's going to be at the university socializing, I think I prefer the latter. Yeah. Okay. Since we're Amanda, Greg, I think we're hitting an hour here. Do you guys want to take final any final questions or? Yeah. There's. Thanks, Matt. You know, if there's anything else, um, um, reach out through Amanda. I'm happy to. You know, she can share my contact information with anybody. If you have questions about what we're doing at Illinois, you want to see copies of whatever we do. I'll I'll, I'll pass. Um, some of the stuff we're creating for Illinois, our, uh, our parent letter, or when we come up with our COVID policy, finalize that, I'll get that out to uh, them as well and uh, they can circulate to everyone on the call. Yeah, I'll um, make sure that we can also send out the recording. I think we're gonna put, put it up on the website. Um, and again, we are updating the ZBT housing website. Um, there's a COVID page on it. Again, the fraternity is also updating it with resources as well. So. There, we have resources, you know, as, as we get them, as we find, I mean, we get a lot of resources. We only put the ones that are, that are truly, you know, I think really helpful. Um, we've gotten a few from James R. Favor, which have been really great. And again, some of the food service ones, and then, you know, anything that we come up with or any policies, but, um, you know, again, we're happy to share with anybody. And, you know, if you guys need anything, don't hesitate to reach out. We're, we're here for you yeah. guys. And Or if you have a good idea that you're going to use locally, share it with yes. everyone because there, there's right. no right answer to what we're doing. Everyone, you know, we, we, right. we're, gonna, we're all going to have local issues and we're going to have our own, you know, our own students that we have to deal with and they're all unique themselves. So um, no right answers and please share. Right. If you come up with something and you think we should know about it, please let us know. Um, as Amanda keeps mentioning our website, just so you guys know, it's zbthousing.org. So um, I also just personally want to thank Amanda and Greg as well. Thank you guys for putting this together and organizing it. Um, I think it was a, a great turnout. Hopefully everybody here 
uh, you know, was able to, to learn something and at least uh, um, gain, gain some knowledge and, and just hear from each other. Hopefully that everybody's in a, a similar boat. So thank you uh, to both of you guys for, for organizing this. So we really appreciate it. So. Can I ask one more question of, of Libby? Um, just about <laughs> rituals. I'm, I'm speaking specifically about what are we going to do about initiation for those of us that have fall um, recruitment when we get back to school? Um, are there going to be some suggestions on how the hell we do that with a, say we have a 50 man chapter and a 20 person initiation class? Andy, we, Andy. oh, go ahead. So um, <clears throat> we were actually, actually the University of Memphis was able to do an initiation this past spring um, before their city shut down. And what they did is they did it in groups. And so, for example, at the time, they could have um, a limited amount of people. So what they did is they did multiple initiations rather than do a large one. So that you're able to do the initiation, um, though it won't be together, you can still get them initiated um, and still have that special moment rather than not do it at all. And we can work with you on that. Okay, thanks. I didn't think about that. That's that's a very good idea. <laughs> Anything else for Libby, for me, for Ron, for Amanda, Greg, for each other? Well, we have we're all together right now. Anybody? All right, guys. Thank you so much, everybody. Greg, thank you again. We really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. I know you've thank attended. You everyone, and thank you for everything you're doing. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Greg.